After the battle began, they could expect many counterattacks by a superior force. When God called you and you were baptized, did you find afterwards that you seemed to go through a lot of trials? Well, it's kind of ordinary. It, could be, it should be expected because, you see, Satan doesn't want to lose one of his. And so when, when, when you're called out by God, Satan's losing one of his. When you come to repentance, Satan's going to try to counteract that calling. So when they took over that bridge for the next 12 hours till he got relief, 181 men had to hold off the German army until they got help. They took the bridge in 15 minutes, and throughout the course of the night, they continually had counterattacks on their men. His job was to hold until relieved. There was, no there was no retreat. There was no way to get out. The only opportunity they had was to overcome. Now, does that draw an analogy to you? There's a scripture I'm going to come into in just a few minutes that talks about that, that you and I can't retreat. We can't go back. There's nowhere to turn once you've accepted that mission. In that job. The job required to hold until completed, they could not turn back. Now, this was the last analogy I want to share with this, and then I'm going to go into some scriptures. Later, he was given a reward for his overcoming. He was given a reward. He didn't go in for the reward. He had no idea that was going to happen, but he was given the second highest reward ever given by the British. Ten years later, he was given a reward by the French for the highest award for what they did there. The British took that bridge, kept it intact. About 10 years ago, they took the entire bridge and put a new Pegasus bridge there and took the whole bridge intact and they moved it to a museum. And that bridge is still there today. The bridge from 1944 that they saved, the primary bridge is still there. And they named the highway from Sword Beach to the, Can Can uh, the town of Cain after Major John Howard. So that's the highway that they have over there by him taking it. But when he went in, he had no idea that that was going to take place. And yet, God tells you and I, he's coming back, and his reward is with him. One, ordinary men called to perform a special mission. Acts 4.13 says, that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You know, you and I, when God calls you and I and he imbues us with his Holy Spirit as begotten children of God, it confounds this world, the wisdom and the understanding that you have. And you need to call upon that wisdom. That's God at work in you. They were specially trained for, for a special purpose. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 says, For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble have called. Now, if you want to brag on something, there's a scripture you can brag on. We're not very wise. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 20 says, Let every man abide in the same calling wherewith he was called. Ephesians 1, verse 18 says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the richness of his glory, of his inheritance is to the saints. Three, they learn by trials under fire. Hebrews 5, 8 says, though he were his son, starting with Jesus Christ, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. You know, people say something, you don't know how you're going to react when things really come down. And sometimes you really don't. But with God's Holy Spirit, you do. Because you can be confident that the Spirit is in you. He will give you the strength to overcome whatever it is that you need to overcome. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Just like that major, when he went through his war games, they were so tired of practicing for six months, they thought they had it down to a fine minute by minute being able to take bridges. When it came down to it, he wasn't ready. And he realized there were shortcomings. Sometimes the fiery trials that you and I ought to purge us to make, make us purify so that God can use us in, down the road. 2 
Make it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Four, as each man was required when they accepted the mission to put their lives on the line, Luke 14, 28, for which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Five, it was a team effort. The French resistance, resistance kept vigil and watch always. And, and, and that's, that is so, you probably could tell me the scripture I'm about to tell you. But let me give you this one, Luke 21, verse 36. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. The French resistance job was to monitor the news and the radio always. They had someone out there day and night taking shifts to listen to the radio because the Allied forces would transmit codes on those radio message to tell who was going to do what and when their job was to move and to take and, and accomplish their mission, whether it was cutting wires to create, to create problems for communications, for blowing up trains, bridges, railroads. Each one of them had to watch always. So you and I do that today. We watch the news. We watch the world events. We see what's taking place, and God gives us the insight to understand the prophecy of things that are happening. And we see what's going on around Jerusalem, around the Middle East, and the problems that are taking place there. Six, after the battle began, they can expect many counterattacks by a superior force. Until Christ returns, you can expect a counterattack by Satan. Shouldn't surprise you. It, it should become the norm that every single day when you wake up, that you would pray to God to protect you, to give you the insight, to give you safety, to look out for what's going on. Not only for you, but your family and those around you. If God has called you and hasn't called the rest of the family, he, Satan will try to affect the rest of the family to deter you from the calling that God has given you. He will ultimately try to destroy anybody around you that God will let them just to destroy the one. So we need to understand that. When you go to bed at night, pray that God will place his angels around your home, around your family and your friends to keep you safe while you sleep so that, that the demons can't infiltrate your mind and counterattack the work that God has put inside of you. A work of love, a work of compassion, a work of concern, the work of preparing the way for the return of Jesus Christ. Now, that commission sounds so ominous. That commission could be as much as a drink of water to someone that God has called. Now, that's the way we need to look at it, because, see, that's the way this mage looked at his job. He looked at it as, this is my job that I have to successfully complete. We don't know how much longer we have, but suppose God has called you, and by your example, will help someone down that God hasn't, helped, hasn't even called yet for 10 more years. But because of your example today, that God will call that person 10 years from now, bring him into the king, kingdom, and become a begotten member of his family by what you've done today. I look back through the history of the church, and you can see that throughout the history. That someone will be called, and because of their example, brings this person into the church. I remember my wife years ago, we were at a campaign when Mr. Armstrong came to New Orleans, and it had a lot of people came in. And she saw somebody leaving right afterwards because, you know, people who don't, aren't in the church, they get a little, like, let me get out of here. Got what they call rabbit in them. Like, let me get out before anybody talks to me or scares me with something. She gave him a card about the church. She said, here, take this with you when you go. The person put it in, the, in his pocket, forgot about it, never considered it again. Six months later, he was going through his wallet for something. He found that card. And because he found that card, he said, God pricked his conscience again. And he started looking into the church again. He's a member of the New Orleans congregation today. So you don't know what at least the littlest thing will do to call somebody. Now, Philippians 1, verse 6. This is under the, the, uh, the analogy of that expecting counterattacks. You can be confident. This is Philippians 1, verse 6. Be confident is the very thing that he which begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. When you reach the point, some, there'll be times in your life that you just don't feel like you can go on any further. You turn to that one scripture. 
And you know with all confidence that whatever God has begun in you, he will not leave you abandoned. You can be confident, it says, that the work that he's begun in, in you, he will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. Now that's confidence and that's boldness and you know it. Therefore, if you walk away from your mission, whatever that mission may be, you are walking out on, the, on, a, on a bold statement of Jesus Christ that he's still there waiting for you. We have no excuses. From the time you accept that, that calling, you have no excuses. Number seven, the job required to hold them to completion, they could not turn back. 2 Peter 2 says, 2 Peter 2 verse 20, For after they had escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome that the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. When we counted the cost, we went through that scripture, that we can't turn back. This is the job that, that, that God has given each one of us. It's a one-on-one -on -one job. Your salvation does not depend on the person sitting next to you. It depends on you and Jesus Christ. Now, I remember a minister years ago used to say, whether anyone else does or not, we must do the right thing. I like that. that was, it was real simple. It was plain. It was right to the core. It doesn't matter what someone else does. Kids like to do that. Yeah, well, so-and-so don't do that. Their parents don't make us do this. Well, it don't matter when salvation comes. What anybody else does, any organization, any group, what matters is between you and Jesus Christ. And whether anybody else does the right thing or not, you must do the right thing. That's pretty simple. Because you're going to stand before him and him alone. When you stand before Jesus Christ, you're going to be like, like Peter when he's talking to John and, and, and says you know, that John would live a long life. You know, and, and he's to say, well, um, well, he was talking to Peter, said that someone's going to come and take you. And he said, looks over at John and said, well, John, what about him? You know, so, so you stand up before Jesus Christ at judgment, and he's starting to accuse you of certain things. And you say, well, yeah, well, what about him? He didn't do that. So your salvation is between you and Jesus Christ alone. It says, for they are again entangled therein and overcome that the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than afterwards they had known, had known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It says, but as it has happened, according to them, according to the true proverb, the dog is returned again to his own vomit. And the sow that washed to her wallowing in the mire. To turn back on the calling that God had given to you and I would be a tantamount to a dog turning to his own vomit. I considered that parallel reverse-wise back to this major. What would have happened the rest of his life is when they landed, they would have ran. What would have happened if that enemy would have been so overwhelming that the British troops would have just 